Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, welcome, guys. Uh, good morning, and I'm glad to see so many of you in the room. My name is Andrei Savu, and I'm going to be the chair for this track and also the first presenter. Um, and, uh, and my talk is called Creating Pools of Virtual Machines. And And um, maybe you are wondering, maybe you don't, some of you know me. I am the founder of Assembler. Assembler is a company that, uh, uh, I'll tell you a bit more later. I'm also organizing the Java user group in Bucharest. And uh, my involvement, I'm involved with the foundation around the Apache Wheel project. I'm a member of the PMC, and in the past I've contributed to, to Zookeeper. And uh, my passions are around uh, deployment automation and uh, data analysis. At Assembler, some of the things we do, again, are data processing, infrastructure, and deployment automation. The main product we are working on, it's uh, called, uh, it's an appliance that can um, deploy Hadoop on demand on cloud infrastructure. Uh, open source is uh, an important part of our work, and we, we do a fair amount of consulting. So the agenda. The, I'm not going to just talk about creating pools of virtual machines as in uh, out of context process. I'm going to tell you a bit more about the product called Apache, uh, uh, Assembler and in the future Apache Provisioner. We are just applied to, to become part of the Apache Incubator. Tell you a bit more about some of the challenges we faced when we want to solve the problem of creating hundreds of virtual machines. Focus on the architecture, show you a demo on how to set up an HDFS cluster on EC2 and uh, invite you to, to vote on the proposal. Uh, so what is provisioner? So this is not a typo. <laughs> and uh, it's a tool. It's actually a service that's designed to, to help you solve this simple task of going from a specification to a set of machines that match uh, some of, some of a, a common set of assumptions on multiple clouds. And our objective with this tool is to provide a, a robust foundation for configuration and for higher level tasks when we do service deployment on cloud infrastructure. Now, I, I said that all the pools, all the clusters we create share a common set of characteristics. Characteristics like a specific operating system, a set of pre-installed packages and files that are downloaded from different sources, a set, uh, same DNS settings, DNS it's a big problem in the cloud. It's not always solved right. Not all the cloud providers have forward and reverse IP uh, DNS resolution for IP addresses. Um, network uh, time settings, network settings, firewall, ways of accessing the cluster over SSH or over VPN. So we want to take, with, with this project, we want to take care of all this and make it solve them in a manner that's consistent across multiple clouds. And why do this? Initially, we started this project at Assembler as a, as a tool that could help us to deploy Hadoop clusters on demand. And the problem is solving for us is, this, is that of doing a basic setup needed to get to the point, point where we can offload the configuration of work to tools like Ambari or Caldera Manager or some other tools that already have the logic of setting up a Hadoop cluster. But we need to get to the point where we have a cluster that already has all the network settings, access, and so on, in some of the pre-installed packages. And now, the functionality of this project is more generic. It's not limited to setting up Hadoop clusters, and we can look at this in a larger perspective. A larger perspective that it's like a loop. So we start with a specification, with an external specification. We begin to create a set of machines, do some basic configs, uh, establish uh, an expected way of accessing them, like over SSH or over VPN. And then we can move to a higher level. We can do configuration. And after configuration, we can enable monitoring on those services or on those machines. And we can close the loop back on provisioning so that we can keep on resizing the or repairing the pool and keep on configuring and so on. So by using this kind of approach, 
we can get to that point where we have truly cloud self-healing applications that take care of themselves that you forget to repair. Just put them there and then they will take care of repairing the infrastructure, provisioning the machines, scaling out, scaling down, and so on. And why is this interesting? Because this is something we can make happen together. I'm not going to work to solve all the problems, but if we put the right interfaces in place, we can solve them together. We can, I would prefer to work on that part, someone else, part of the, let's, let's say the Apache Wheel community can work on doing higher level configuration for services. Someone else maybe it's interested in just doing monitoring and so on. So, but we can get to the point where we can link everything together. And we can link them by, by uh, basing our communication on different APIs and the events and protocols. So one of the common questions I, 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 I receive is that, how is this different from, from Puppet? And I hope I have answered this so far. So it's not, provisionary is not Puppet. It's actually using Puppet, but the focus is different. It's the, our objective is to interact with the infrastructure APIs to store machines in groups with minimal configs as listed before to match those assumptions. And to, that, to do that in a simple and reliable fashion. So we've got down to the point where we have a system that works pretty good on Amazon. We've done skill testing with over 15 nodes and it beha behaves as expected. Um, some of the challenges we faced are the following. So first of all, when you start to provision more than just five VMs, you start to hit API throttling. Uh, and you start to hit that because not all the cloud providers give you batch operations. So in some cases, you will end up doing too many API calls to check the machine, virtual machine status or for different other types of calls. So you need to build into your system a way to handle back off and to have a good way of uh, controlling the concurrency. And that gets harder when you have to control concurrency across multiple instances to get some level of scalability. And that, that's, a, that's a difficult problem that makes it difficult to keep on doing, of having the same approach of maybe using bash scripts for orchestration or something simple at scale when you want to go over 100 machines. Another important problem is that error handling becomes difficult and becomes difficult to handle partial failures. And um, you don't want to have a process that does a retry and provisions 100 VMs twice because that's going to get expensive. If you, if you hit this error condition often and you end up provisioning hundreds of machines multiple times without having, without knowing about them that they become, that they exist, you'll end up paying a lot for that. So to handle this, you need to design your, the, the way you interact with the API to, to accommodate for partial failures. In some cases it's easy because the, API, the, the cloud API gives you ways to, uh, to forward client tokens that they can understand and they can make the APIs uh, tell you that, okay, you've sent me this operation already. You've asked for, you've asked for these machines. I've already answered your questions. Maybe you didn't get the answer back, but they are here. And uh, to, to make this happen, we focused a lot on making each step from a, from a process that creates the pool. It, the, it the important and can be retried as many times as a user wants. Second set of challenges. Uh, you want to have granular workflows because you are going to put them as part of a larger process. You handle transitions in some cases by keeping open transactions in our case. So you want to keep them small because that gives you also uh, time to react. You don't want to block inside activities. You don't want to uh, block on timeouts. You want to keep timeouts low and so on. And it's also extremely important at when working with larger cluster to do a good job at persisting state. 
and not only persistent state between restarts, but also persisting state between upgrades. Because you don't want to start to provision 500 VMs, and that process should, uh, you don't want that process to fail if you need to deploy a new version or restart the application server or so on. So you want to, to build this kind of uh, ability to persist state and recover state into the system. And uh, also extremely important is that in this kind of system, you want to have good visibility into what is happening. You want to be able to see how many calls I've sent, okay, what new machines I've got, what are those ideas, what happened, uh, who interacted with the system, and so on. Another set of challenges is that when you are starting to work with multiple cloud providers, you will start to work with multiple SDKs. And that means that you'll have to integrate them inside the same, in our case, inside the same JVM. That's becoming a challenge. One answer that we've decided to, one answer we found to that problem is to use OSGI to package everything together and keep the class pad nice and clean. Um, and this comes together with, with this idea of providing a plugin architecture. So we want to, prov to think about each cloud provider as being something that implements an API. We don't want to know more about it. We want to work with the API and then bring the implementations that provide the functionality we need for that API. And again, this is something we take more or less for granted from the OSGI world. And we also it's important because I've seen that in practice people do a lot out of automation, but also work with cluster in a more my, uh, in, the, in a semi-automated fashion. So you want to be able to support both world, uh, both ways of operating in a semi-automated or fully automated fashion. And uh, the last challenge we face is that when creating hundreds of virtual machines that process looks like a denial of service attack for many external services. So if you are going to install packages, an external system will all of a sudden see 100 requests of downloading those packages. Or maybe some other system will start to, to see this behavior. And to, to mitigate that, one way of doing it is to create a, automatically create a golden image that you can then use to bootstrap that larger cluster. This makes the process also a lot faster, more reliable, more predictable, and it's useful in many ways. And we want to automate this process to, to make it like a side effect of starting a, a larger cluster. So from an architecture point of view, uh, we've been lucky enough to be able to reuse many existing components that answer to all the challenges I, I've listed before. One of them is activity from Alfresco. Activity is the backbone for all we do from an orchestration point of view. It has a nice Java API, has a nice set of tools for both for creating processes, but also for watching the processes while in execution. It handles, so far it handles all our persistence needs and has good enough error handling so that you can, as long as you design your activities as retriable units, you can get pretty good uh, error handling. This is how a part of a process looks like. Um, what I, if you have used in the past BPM and BPM solution, this is nothing new. But what I want to show you here is that, for example, in the, in the initial implementation, we had no timeouts, so the process was could eventually get stuck in a, in, a, in a states and never get out of that. And it was really easy when we decided that we want timeouts to just create loops and add timeouts inside the process. So no code changes were needed to make the overall process more reliable by uh, adding something called a boundary timer event. So th th and this is also powerful and I think it's quite easy from a contributor perspective because this is the single entry point that you, if you are going to work with a specific provider, your best chance to, to get a good understanding of the process is to start from the diagram. You open that, see the classes involved, start to look into each activity, 
and then you find out the place where you want to put your new functionality, change the diagram, and that's, that's it, you are done. Because it, it was really easy, for example, to move from only supporting on-demand instances on Amazon to also supporting spot instances. We just had to create a new branch that started spot instances, publish the IDs in the same way we've done it with on-demand instances, and the rest of the process worked as expected. Activity is also nice because it gives you an interactive view. An interactive view uh, that um, it's available while the process is running. You can see where is the process right now executing, what job it's executing, is it blocked, what happened, and so on. And this is, this is powerful from a user perspective because you don't blindly look through log files. An image like this is far more useful than just a log file. And the second key component we are using for, to, to make this, uh, this system possible is Apache Caraf. Uh, we are using it as an application server, but also as a way of, create, of packaging the product. Uh, it's nice because it provides you with uh, easy way to start things. We have an interactive shell. It has good integration with activity. And we can bundle everything as a single archive that you just download. It has good defaults. That you, all you have to do is just start it, add your credentials, and you have everything else. You have the Activity Explorer already running as part of the uh, Caraf instance. You have uh, all the services already running and so on. So you, you get a shell like this that you can inspect in an interactive fashion many things, like you can see uh, what activity is doing, what are deployments, what processes are running, and so on. You can uh, run many commands that are provisionally related, like creating a pool, inspecting a pool. Uh, maybe if you faced a, a major failure, like your internet connection failed, and uh, the system exhausted all the retries, you can ask the system to retry more after you fix the problem. So it's, it's flexible in many ways. And we are also using, as I said before, many of the uh, client SDKs. We are using the Amazon SDK, and we are using JClouds for Cloud Stack, and we are using also for, for other cloud providers. So let me show you a quick video that shows the product in while well working. Okay, so this is an interactive session, just starting it. Uh, it's pre-configured with the Amazon credentials. There are no running pools. We ask the system to create a pool on the Amazon provider with a specific key, 10 nodes, and we just need for this demo the small instances. And we see the process started here, and we are shipping all the logs from the machines back to the interactive shell in the interactive fashion. Here is the process while executing. This is the main management instance. That's what you've seen there, the, the red circle. It's the current activity that, that the, the process engine is executing. And uh, here are individual processes for each machine. And the output for each machine can be tracked in an interactive fashion by looking at the log file. And then, after a while, the process gets to, the, to a steady state. In this case, we get to, some, to a loop that it doesn't do anything right now, but later on it should do like checking that all the machines are still there, or deciding that you need to add a new one, or deciding that you need to remove one, and so on. And what you see here is that this is the, the last step from configuring a machine. All the packages have been installed as requested. So this is, the, this is a really useful from a debugging perspective. We are just shipping directly the, the output from the SSH commands that we are running on the, on the machine as log messages in your log files. And they are all, you don't see here, but they are all annotated so you can easily filter them by the, by, uh, the machine ID or by other parameters.
And this is really nice from an integration point of view. I don't know if you know about Randek. Randek provides you with a nice uh, application that can do command execution on, on machines. And uh, Randek has this idea of a resource model source. So it can consume a list of nodes as published by other systems. So we, ha we added in, in Provisioner uh, a URL that exposes the, all the machines from all the pools as a list of, as an XML file. And these XML files can be consumed by Randek. So what you see here is the list fetched in real time from provisioner from a provisioner instance running on the same machines. So we can have we have those ten nodes we started a few minutes a uh, few minutes ago, and we can run commands on them. In this case, we are going to set up an HDFS cluster, and uh, we have uh, Randek has this idea of having job flows as a set of scripts that are executed in sequence. Yeah. That was So we had this script here that has a few lines of code, the bash scripts that are just extracted from the online documentation uh, that knows how to set up HDFS. And uh, the only parameter this, uh, this job flow needs is just the, the host name, the private host name of the node that will become the name node in this cluster. So we provide that by getting it from this or from the previous screen. And in a few minutes, what we get is a HDFS cluster running on EC2 that was set up in, in this case by using a semi-automated, uh, in a semi-automated fashion. But you can imagine that it's easy to take this process and turn it into a set of API calls. Okay. And the last part just shows you that, okay, we have these instances running and the, the HDFS uh, cluster is up and running. Okay, so to summarize, um, the problem we want to solve with provision is that of, cre of creating large pools of virtual machines. Uh, and uh, while doing this, we want to solve the cloud portability problems by making the clusters and the machines in those clusters indistinguishable from an application perspective. So if we start the same cluster on Amazon or a cloud stack, from an application perspective, it should be impossible to realize that you are running on Amazon or on cloud stack. And I invite you to vote. There is a proposal I sent yesterday on general at incubator, and I want to start maybe a vote today. Uh, and we are still looking for mentors and contributors. Thank you. If you have questions, I'm all ears. Microphone. You have a mic? Another one? Okay. Just just at the single VM level. So do you do a, do we do any orchestration? No, at the cluster level, just as a, as a, v, a single VM level by installing the packages and what you need. So what, what tools would you recommend to use for orchestration? What we've used so far and works pretty good to set up things is Rundeck and has a good integration. We want to do even more from this point of view and bundle Rundeck together with Provisioner as part of the same distribution and uh, add nice things like uh, make Provisioner automatically publish the <coughs> list of machines, create a pro uh, project in Rundeck, maybe even push a set of configured job flows for different services. That will be on the, on the short term. Later on, I see this being integrated in Apache Weir that will handle configuration. Yeah. It, it's making Weir better. So we can set up a cluster on Amazon, but it fails if you go over 20 nodes right now. We can go, by working together, we can do that work for 100 nodes. So
So uh, it is possible to contribute to wear uh, this functionality. I had this discussion with Tom White, the, the lead of Apache Wear, and I've been a PMC on Wear for one year already. So uh, the discussion we had is how would it be better to bring, to bring this project to the Apache Foundation as a sub-project of Wear or as a standalone project? I don't have to uh, an answer to that question yet. That's why we want to go through the incubation and later on decide if it's better for us to graduate as a sub-project, if there is a large overlap between communities, or as a standalone project if we discover that there is a distinct community that needs this kind of service. Thank you. Please. Okay, so for someone that doesn't understand that much about Puppet, how is provision different from from Puppet? So Puppet was initially designed to handle the task of setting up a single machines, making sure that some packages exist, some files exist, some services are running. Recently, Puppet added more abilities to work with different types of cloud infrastructure. But that's not something that, as far as I know, uh, Puppet is pushing to make it happen and work well, as expected. So I think we are filling a gap here. We want to handle the, uh, the interactions with different APIs, and we want to use the best tool for the job. In this case, we are using Puppet to handle the configuration of a single machine. So they are complementary. I, we are friends. <laughs> Given a cluster, how do you decide which is the maximum number of virtual machines? That's something that the user provides. So when creating a cluster, you provide the minimum size and the expected size. Because, uh, for example, maybe you want 50 nodes to run a Hadoop cluster, but you can still run your job if we manage to provision 40. So it's, uh, we provide a, a range. And that's not something that we decide automatically, that's something that the user provides as an input. Yes. So both Cloudera Manager and Horton Oris Ambari solve the problem of setting up a Hadoop cluster. They don't do provisioning, as in bringing up machines. From this point of view, we are complementary. So what we are doing at Assembler is actually starting with Provisioner to create the cluster and then offloading the configuration work through the API to Cloudera Manager. So as soon as we bring the machines up and we have the right way of accessing the cluster, we just use Cloudera Manager to set up the daemons and all the configuration cluster. So there again, the Provisioner can work as an extension to Cloudera Manager and Abari. So auto-scaling is not something that we support right now. I want to support later on. Uh, the reason I expect Amazon to bring this kind of services sooner or later as part of their platform, because they've done this repeatedly over time and they improve the platform in many ways. Uh, but we are also targeting multiple clouds. So even if we have cloud formation in Amazon, we don't have cloud formation in Rackspace. Yeah, yeah. So we 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 are. Um, let's go over them. We don't have that much time. So we are, for example, for API throttling, we are making sure that we use as much as possible batch operations on on APIs. And if we are not using batch operations, we have a good way of handling retries so that we don't overload the ex external services. Concurrency control is provided by, activ by activity. Uh, error handling and partial failures, again, they are built in, in in the activities and also the activity, the process engine gives us some ways of handling error uh, 
failures. Nothing right now. I want to do something later. So right now it just failed and actually provisional will not know they failed. Okay, so we are out of time. Think so no, we still have time. So you have questions please. Uh, it started as something we needed to make Hadoop on demand work for us. Uh, I want to propose this project to the Apache Foundation because I think it's far more it's useful for other for other types of system and services. Like for example, let's say you want to set up a web tier. That means that you have to bootstrap a number of machines, pre-install Nginx or a Python stack or something else, do some configuration, and then you uh, ongoing you have to either resize or downsize the, the cluster. So it, it provides the building block you need to build that kind of automation. It doesn't solve the problem completely, but you have a lot of the building blocks you need to solve it. So what are the advantages of automating a process like this? Um, it's much better than, I mean, I've seen a lot of automation being done with bash scripts. You can do that, it works. Use the VC2 command line tools, you can do a lot with bash scripts. But bash is not good at handling failures, bash is not good at recovering, bash is not good at logging, bash is not good. You can do it, but it's hard. <laughs> uh, so, this is a, a better stack for solving those problems. You are, we are using off-the-shelf products that are good at some specific use cases. For example, uh, activity is good at managing processes, long-running processes. We use it that for, we, we are using it because of this fact. So like activity and running it, are those Apache license? Apache license, yes. They're not at Apache Foundation, but they are Apache licensed. In the back, for a sec. How do we deal with spot instances disappearing? Uh, we don't. We want to. I mean, I, I've showed you that when the process ends, it ends in the loop. We want to extend that loop to become a monitoring loop. So we will deal with them eventually. No, it should have maybe enforced the, uh, the minimum size of the cluster. So if it falls behind the minimum size, just start new ones until you get the expected size. Yes. Not yet. That's something we are working on. I, maybe by next two iterations will happen. Because I think that's critical if you want to go over a few hundreds of machines. And people are doing this already, but they are doing it in a in manual fashion, building by hand golden images or by using tools like Puppet, AutoAmi for it. Yeah, <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>